Right behind me is the real life Dark Star aircraft that was used on set during the opening scene of Top Gun Maverick. This hypersonic concept jet was actually designed by Lockheed Martin's top secret Skunk Works division. Well today, I hope you brought your Top Gun gear because we're getting an up close look at Dark Star to learn what went into designing this aircraft as well as how important hypersonic technology is for the future. Now I'm excited to introduce you to Skunk Works engineer, Brian Hirschberger, who also just so happens to be the lead on the Dark Star project. Now, Brian, I've got a lot of questions for you, but right off the bat for all the viewers out there, can this thing actually fly? Is there a real life flyable Dark Star out there somewhere? Sam, with movie magic, this can fly. <laughs> okay. But in the real world, this is a mock-up of our hypersonic airplane concept for the Top Gun movie. But what it represents really is our leading edge in hypersonics and how Lockheed Martin and the Skunk Works are really pushing the boundaries of hypersonics. And this is a futuristic vision of what that could be someday. Now, I know we've mentioned this word hypersonic several times. I also know it's probably going to frame a lot of what we're talking about today. So for all the viewers out there, can you explain what is hypersonics? Well, Sam, you've probably heard a lot about subsonic and supersonic. Hypersonic is actually Mach 5. Wow. Okay. And Mach 5 is a mile per second. So if you think about trying to go cross country, taking off from Los Angeles and making it to New York, you'd make it there in 45 minutes. Now imagine in Top Gun Mach where 10. Maverick's going Mach 10 yeah. and how insane that must be. Crazy fast. Crazy fast. Now, before we take a closer look at Dark Star, I am curious, what was the process like working with Paramount Pictures on Top Gun Maverick and really how that came to be? Well, so after Paramount reached out because of Lockheed Martin's leadership position in, in hypersonics, they paired us up with Daniel Simon, who is a graphic designer who does a lot of concepts in movies. You've probably seen some of them. You don't know what they are. <laughs> yeah. So we worked with him and our conceptual design team to come up with some ideas. We bounced ideas back and forth and iterated, and we came up with, uh, I think, iteration 43, which yeah. you see sitting here in front of us today. And it's like, what better place to go for a futuristic hypersonic jet than Skunk Works? So I'm sure it was like a perfect match for, for Paramount and for you guys, Project was awesome. It was a great interaction, and uh, I think everybody on both sides is really proud with the product we were able to produce in terms of how it's made an impact on, on people's uh, vision of the future, and, and what a great movie. Sam, the first thing you'll notice when we're looking towards the front of the, the Dark Star is how highly swept it is and yeah. how sleek it is. That's what you see when you go really fast, right? You got, you got a lot of air coming around, you want to be like a dart. Like disappears. On top of that, we bury the cockpit. Unlike most cockpits that sit up a little bit, we bury it down. And if you actually know what our X-59 demonstrator is that's yeah. doing supersonic similar boom design. technology, similar design. It's that getting that forward vision in different ways, but still being able to see out the sides a little bit. And I love how it still has the uh, Captain Pete Mitchell Maverick. Absolutely. And also, it's interesting to me, right? It doesn't look like you can see out the front, right? So you've got the side view, which I know in the movie he had it like kind of built into display, but just an interesting feature. Absolutely, but there's technology that can allow you to do yeah, that you today. Yeah, you need it. Now, Brian, in the movie, when Maverick is about to approach Mach 10, we start to see the cockpit glass heating up, and I love that attention to detail that was included. So I'm curious, from your perspective, what would you say are those main challenges that heat and friction present when going at hypersonic speeds? So Sam, remember, Mach 5 is where we start to see uh, hypersonics be defined, and it's yeah. defined there because that's when air starts to break down because of how fast you're going. You start to see plasma show up around the airplane, just like on the space shuttle re-entry. So what that means is you have to have materials that can survive these intense temperatures. You have to still build them light enough to be able to fly. So it takes a whole lot of development and technology in terms of how you build the craft to make it survive the environment. So in the movie, obviously we had Maverick flying, but to my understanding, the future of hypersonics is largely unmanned. So I'm curious, from your perspective, do you ever think we will have a pilot in the cockpit of something going hypersonic? Well, Sam, remember we talked a little bit about the space shuttle. Yeah. Space shuttle went over Mach 20 when it re-entered the atmosphere, and it had people in it. So That's it true. is possible. But in terms of the mission, it really depends on what the mission needs. Sometimes you need the gray matter inside the cockpit to make decisions, and other times you don't. And that's really what will determine whether or not you need to have one or not. So is it harder to have a cockpit? Yes. But is it impossible? No. When I was in the theaters watching this for the first time, I love seeing those little details like the Skunk Works logo on the tail, some Lockheed branding mixed throughout. 
Are there any other Easter eggs you guys included that you can share? Well, Sam, the Skunk Works on the Tails is something we like to do when we get <laughs> okay. airplanes out there. When we can, try to have a little bit of the, the mystique carried over. The Easter eggs that we ended up creating are mostly in the cockpit. Uh, what you'll find is that there's a team that built this airplane, very short Skunk Works timeline. Uh, and so as they did that, they found creative ways to get some of their stamp on that. So you'll see some initials on switches and some on the panel that you can pick up in the movie if you're really sharp. Another thing you're going to notice is how large the engines are on this airplane. What do you think it takes to go hypersonic? Lots of thrust. Yeah, and in the movie, after Maverick had taken off, I see he says switching to scramjet, right? And then it looks like there's a lot of power converted to the engines, allowing him to go even faster. So I'm curious, can you explain what actually a scramjet is? So a scramjet is the engine that you would want to use when you go above Mach 5. Okay. Now you think about like how an SR-71 works. It has a normal engine in it with like rotating machinery. And as you bring the air in, you slow it down nicely to burn that, burn that air at subsonic speeds. There's a D-21 drone. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, it, it went on top it of... It flies yeah. off a of Blackbird, so it starts off at about Mach 3. Yeah. And what it does is rather than his, use a rotating engine, it actually takes the pressure from the air coming in and use it, uses it just to combust the air because it's already hot enough. It does that subsonically. Guess what a scramjet does? Is it burns that air inside that engine supersonically. Could you imagine lighting a match in a hurricane and no. keeping it lit? That's what this, That's is like. what this does. Another thing we paid a lot of attention to detail on would be, you know, kind of how you would shape the wing of a hypersonic airplane that still has to land and take off from a runway. It kind of reminds me of the wing shapes on the SR-71 that we were talking about. Did that kind of give you guys a little inspiration? Not so much inspiration, but it's the design guidance you right. would use okay. to do those sorts of things. So it works on that, it's the same sort same of principle. Same kind of principles. Yeah, it's so thin. I mean, it's, it's just, it's so cool looking. I don't even know what to say. They but. gotta be super thin to go fast. That's true. Now, Brian, I'm assuming you had to work on this project in secrecy, which you're probably pretty used to when it comes to working at Skunk Works. But what was it like to finally be able to share this project with the world when Top Gun Maverick finally came out? Sam, you're spot on. But to add to that, four years we had to wait since we actually built this and had it on set until the movie came out. What was really impactful was when uh, even the team that didn't work on it went and saw it. We got some feedback from them that really made me proud because they were happy to see that the Skunk Works had a part in that, that they were able to see get, get their own work where they don't get to share it with any people. Now they could kind of share these are the kind of things we could do. And that really made the whole team that contributed to this really, uh, really proud for the work they did and really happy how the whole film came out. Well, on behalf of so many aviation and Top Gun lovers, thank you for all the work you did on this. I mean, it turned out incredible. And I forgot to say, I love the hat. I got the shirt on. Thanks awesome, so man. Much. Thank you, Sam. Now, you may have noticed the hints we've been dropping throughout the video, and that's because you really can't talk about Dark Star without mentioning the aircraft that helped inspire both its design and functionality. Built back in the 1960s, this platform still holds the record today for the fastest manned air-breathing jet to ever fly. Yep, I'm talking about the legendary SR-71 Blackbird. Lucky enough for us, there just so happened to be one on display right next to Dark Star. And you guys already know, I definitely had to check it out. Well, Sam, I know you've had a chance to talk to Brian a little bit about Dark Star and going hypersonic, but here, the SR-71, this is where it all started. I'm actually a massive fan of the SR-71. It was actually the name of the squadron I was in at the Air Force Academy, the Badass Blackbird. Surprisingly, this is the first time I've ever seen one in person, and it's incredible looking. I actually started my career on the SR-71. Full circle for you. It is. That's awesome. Well, I'm excited to learn a little bit about it from you, and uh, what an incredible aircraft. Awesome. Let's get into it. So Keith, I imagine when designing the SR-71, there are quite a lot of setbacks and challenges that the Skunk Works team had to navigate. Can you talk a little bit about those and how they paved the way for hypersonic technology today? As Brian mentioned, when you go hypersonic, or in this case, a Mach 3, you have a lot of heat and the heat builds up. The skin of this vehicle actually gets to um, 500 degrees. And so you have to have materials that can handle that kind of temperature. Here we had titanium was the solution. Titanium is uh, an interesting material because it's very hard for manufacturing. So we had to even build separate manufacturing techniques for this. Along with that, how do you keep the aircraft cool? It turns out fuel is the way of doing that. And there's actually special fuel, JP-7, that was developed just for the SR-71. So Keith, why is there such an urgent need for hypersonic technology today, especially to make it a critical capability for the US military? 
Well, as you've seen in the news, we have both hypersonic uh, vehicles that are being tested by the Russians and by the Chinese. And so our adversaries have these capabilities. What makes hypersonics so important is that the amount of time it, from when we can actually see a vehicle till we can track it, till we can target it, until we can prosecute that is a finite amount of time. And when it's going fast, it makes it hard to hit. So for us, we want to make sure that we're staying um, par with our adversaries, but actually we want to always be ahead. Well, Sam, come with me for a minute. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the other things that we had to do for heat on the SR-71. So notice these tires are silver in color. That's yeah. because they're infused with aluminum. That helps protect these, these tires from all the heat. You'll also notice behind me, there's a cavity that we use to protect that. The other thing that's really interesting is the amount of hydraulic fluid um, that we have that we have to keep cool here. So we had to devise a whole new hydraulic fluid and that um, is really cold uh, when we take off. So we have to heat it up so that it starts to be fluid uh, for the aircraft. It's just crazy to me. I mean, this thing was built, what, late 50s, early 60s when it flew for the first time and still technology to this day, there hasn't really been something that's flown faster. Yeah, it's very amazing all of the engineering that Kelly Johnson and that team did to develop this aircraft. So to my understanding, Lockheed Martin really has been the industry leader in developing new hypersonic technology for what, the past 60 years? Yes, we started thinking back to the SR-71 and we've been advancing. In fact, in the, in the 2010 timeframe, we had a program called Falcon. In Falcon, we had a vehicle that went Mach 20. So you get an idea of, of that. We're pushing technology now, both for the um, Air Force, the Navy, and um, the Army and different hypersonic programs that are current. So on that, can you talk a little bit about that hypersonic technology that Lockheed Martin's, you know, leading from the front? Sure. The, you know, some of the things that are really um, the, the important to keep is what do we need to be doing for engine technology? So advancements in the scramjets, how do we get those so that they're much less expensive than they were in the past? And how do we keep going with advanced materials, right? You think about a dark star and all of that glow that you had on the nose when in the, in the film. How do we have that so that our hypersonic vehicles are survivable? So Keith, I know you probably can't share too much, but what can you tell us about the future of hypersonics? What can we expect? You'll see advancements in some of the technologies like in sensors and adding communications. You'll see advancements in some of the ways that we manufacture things. Think about the scramjets. We can use additive manufacturing to make scramjets much less expensive. We'll also um, use the digital transformation to be able to build vehicles much cheaper. Our goal is to be able to build hypersonic vehicles that are mainstream. They're not that niche type of vehicle. They're just common. And maybe, just maybe, a real flyable dark star, right? Well, in the Skunk Works, if you can imagine it, we like to be able to implement it, just maybe. Well, Keith, thank you so much to both you and Brian for showing us around. I think it's safe to say there's a lot to be excited for. I know I need to find a way to get out here and do an entire video on the SR-71, but this was definitely a good taste. Now, to anyone watching, if you have a question about Dark Star or Hypersonics, I'd love to hear it. Leave it down in the comments below. Thanks so much for tuning in, and as always, I'll catch you next time.